everyone, this is Amy Johnson Crow, and so glad that you could join us this week for the archives.com live stream. This week we are coming at you not quite live because as you are watching this, I'm going to be winging my way to the Roots Tech Conference in Salt Lake City, where I hope to see a lot of you there. So we wanted to make sure that we have a great uh, show this week, so we're pre-recording and uh, this week we are going to be tackling the time of their lives, discovering your ancestors with timelines. And timelines are a wonderful tool to use in your genealogy research. It's a great way to take a slightly different look at some of the things that you've been finding. And I hope that you'll find that uh, that this does turn into a good tool that, that you will add to your, your quiver, so to speak, of, of tools that you can use in your genealogy. So when it comes to genealogy and family history, a lot of times it boils down to organization. There are a lot of facts, there's a lot of names, dates, places, so we need some tools to try to help keep it all organized. And probably the most common tool that we're used to is the ancestor chart, or sometimes you'll see it called a pedigree chart. The ancestor chart is really suited for seeing all of those direct ancestors at a glance. And you can see exactly which branches aren't filled in. So the ancestor chart is really designed to help you organize and help you visualize those direct ancestors to see the exact branches on the tree. Now another tool that we use quite frequently is the family group sheet. And the family group sheet is wonderful for seeing the husband, the wife, and all of their children. So it's a wonderful way to visualize and put together, organize the information of a particular family. So that's really the strength of the family group sheet. Well, so much of our research is based on an individual. So what sort of tool can we use to help us visualize and help us organize that information that we have found for an individual? Well, that's really where the timeline comes in because the timeline is a different way of looking at the events in your ancestor's life. It's a different view than what you get on an ancestor chart, and it's a slightly different view than what you get on a family group sheet. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it puts the focus on an individual rather than a family or several generations. And it puts the events in chronological order and you can design the timeline however you want. A good way to do it is to add things like ages, sources, notes, and you'll see why those are important here momentarily. So, with everything that you want to find in your genealogy, you know, there are so many records to look at, there are so many people to consider, and now I'm suggesting that there's one more thing that you should perhaps create you might be thinking, well, why do I want to do that? Well, a timeline can help you find gaps in your research. It can also help you find inconsistencies in your research. And, and I think this is probably the most exciting aspect of a timeline, it can spark ideas for new things to look for. A neat thing about timelines is that you don't need a lot of specialized equipment to, to make one. You can make it however it's comfortable for you to organize the data. You want it to be something that's easy to use and you want it to be flexible. When I'm creating a timeline, I usually use a spreadsheet like Excel or Numbers, something like that where I already have a table built in. So spreadsheets are really, really ideal for creating timelines. If you're more comfortable using a word processing program, consider using Word or you know, any other word processing document, something where you can create columns. And of course, there's always good old paper and pencil. Again, whatever is comfortable for you to use. 
So here is a very basic timeline. We have at the top the person's name, John Jones, and we have columns for date of the event. Now normally I would put in an exact date if I had it, but just for clarity's sake so we could get everything on the screen and still have you be able to read it, I just put in the years. But we have a column for the date, for the person's age when that event happened, what type of event, the place where the event took place, information about the source, where did I find out this information, along with some notes. So I have here very basic events in the life of John Jones, his birth in Ohio in 1840, found him in the census in 1850 and 1860, his enlistment in the Civil War in 1861, when he was discharged in 1865, a marriage in 1867, the censuses of 1870 and 1880, and then his death in 1889. So again, just something very basic, but you can see the type of organization that we're talking about when we're talking about creating a timeline. So let's go ahead and build a timeline. Let's see how this data gets put together and how we can use it. I started with very basic facts about George K. Cassidy. I found a record of his death in the Oregon Death Index. And he died in 1965 at the age of 78. And he died in Multnomah County, Oregon. And there was a note that his wife's name was Lena. So from a death date of 1965 and of age of 78, gave us a date of birth approximately 1887. So this is really all I had to get started with George K. Cassidy. But just looking at these two events, his birth and his death, what ideas does this give us for research? Well, think about five things that should immediately come to mind, and that would be the censuses where he should appear. Of course, the most recent census that we have access to is 1940. So we should look for him in 1940, 1930, 1920, 1910, and 1900. Unfortunately, the 1890 census was mostly destroyed, so that's not very viable for us to consider looking for him in 1890. But this gives us five things to look for just based on the years of his birth and his death. Now, when you, when you have a timeline like this, and I do like to go in and put in the things that I want to find, but I like to put them in a different color. So I know that it's something that I haven't yet found. It's something that I want to find. And you can decide your own method for doing that. You know, however you want to note the things that you want to look for. But remember, a good way to do research is to work from the known to the unknown. So rather than jumping all the way back to 1900, let's start with 1940. That's closer to what I know about him in 1965, that he died in Multnomah County, Oregon. Is that where I'm going to find him in the 1940 census? Well, it's a good place to start looking. And when I went to the 1940 census, there I found George Cassidy, and this is in Multnomah County, Oregon. I found George Cassidy with his wife, Lena. That's what I expected. And also living with him in 1940 was his son, Robert. Now look at what else we find in the census besides the names and relationships of the people. We also have their place of birth. So we've picked up now that George was born in Illinois, Lena born in Indiana, but look, son Robert is born in Idaho. So we can take this information and go back to George's timeline. So I've now filled in his information from the 1940 census. And 
I expected his age to be 53, but it was reported as 42. But the wife was the same, and it was the right location. So I'm still pretty confident that this is the right guy. But look what else I can add. I've now added a new event here in 1915, and that's the birth of his son in 1915, and he was born in Idaho. Now, normally I would go back and look for them in the 1930 census, but to kind of speed things along, I want to show you what I found when I looked for him in 1920. Now here's George Cassidy, George K. Cassidy, as I expected to find him. This time he does have the correct age, 34, that's what I expected. His wife, Lena, also who I expected, and there's that son, Robert, again. And again, look at the birthplaces of the rest of the children. So not only was Robert born in Idaho, son George was born in Idaho, daughter Lenora was born in Utah, and daughter Dorothy was born in Illinois. So look at all of those places where George and Lena have been, at least reporting that that's where their children were born. Again, that's in 1920. But when I take this information and I then add it back to George's timeline, we have the son Robert born in 1915 in Idaho. We have the other son who was born in 1914 in Idaho. We have a daughter born in 1911 in Utah and a daughter born in 1909 in Illinois. So as I've been finding George in the census in Multnomah County, Oregon, if I can't find him there in 1910, well, there's probably a reason for that. He's probably either in Illinois, where his daughter was born in 1909, or in Utah, where his daughter was born in 1911. So those are two places where I want to start looking for George in 1910. Maybe I want to, instead of looking for them in Multnomah County, Oregon, and I'm not finding them, I should be taking a look at George Cassidy's in Illinois and Utah. Again, basing it on the points that I have on his timeline. And when I look at that 1910 census, and I find them. Here we have George K. Cassidy, his wife Lena, and daughters Dorothy and Lenora. And in 1910, they were living in Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, Utah. But it was by using the timeline that I got that good lead on where I would find George Cassidy in 1910. I didn't have to just look blindly, you know, across the entire United States when I didn't find him in Multnomah County, Oregon. I could look at his timeline and see places and, and dates and associated with George Cassidy that gave me the clue that I should be looking in Utah or, or Illinois. And as the case turned out, he was actually in Utah. So then I can add that to his, to his timeline that I did find him in 1910 in the census in Salt Lake County, Utah. So when I want to go back and look for him in 1900, considering that his, his first child, his daughter was born in 1909 in Illinois and that George was born in Illinois, that's probably where I want to start looking not only for George in the 1900 census, but also to look for marriage records for George and Lena. Chances are they were married in Illinois. You know, those are the odds. Of course, they, they could have gone someplace else to be married, but that's the logical place to start looking for those records based upon when and where he was likely in 1900 
and then closer to the birth of his daughter in 1909. Also looking at a timeline like this, and it's a reason that I like to include ages when I'm putting together a timeline. Because we tend to think, oh, you know, there are certain records that we should always look for. Well, you know, he didn't die until 1965. What about World War II records? Well, consider how old he was in 1940. Now remember, the census reported him as being age 42. It should have been more like 52 or 53. But even if 42 would happen to have been correct, it's a little old for military service in World War II. So that's probably not a record group that I want to immediately start looking for. However, if I go up a couple of decades, and what would have been in here between 1915 and 1920? We had World War I. And he's a little bit on the, the older side, but still would have been required to register for the draft. So that's something that I do want to take a look at, is finding a World War I draft record for George K. Cassidy. But again, it's using that timeline of being able to compare the date and his age with other events that are going on to see if it makes sense. And in this case, it does. It makes sense to look for him in World War I draft records, probably not for World War II. I also like to use timelines as a sanity check. Now let's say that we have a woman who was born in 1845. So in the 1850 census, she should be five. The 1860 census, she should be 15. In 1870, she should be 25. Does this woman seem to be a candidate to be the, the mother of someone born in 1856? Probably not, because in 1856, she would only have been 11. That's a little bit young to be giving birth. So this woman really is not a candidate for someone who was born in 1856. So again, using that timeline, comparing the dates and comparing the ages can be a good sanity check. Another thing to look at, again, using a timeline as a sanity check, and sometimes these situations kind of get hidden when you're looking at it on a family group sheet because there is so much going on on a family group sheet. There's so much information. But when we take a timeline and just look at one person and adding just the births of the children who she's supposed to have. Now let's take a look at this. A woman born in 1825, yes, she feasibly could have a child when she was 15. So, so this one does seem kind of plausible. But then look at the next three children, supposedly all born in 1841. Now, it's not unheard of to have twins. It's much more rare in this time period to have triplets and especially have all three of them live to adulthood. And then have another child in 1842, but then no more children until 1870, when she was age 45. Now, any one of these births does seem plausible, but when you put them all together, it just seems a little bit odd to have one child when you're 15, three children when you're 16, another child when you're 17, and no more children until you turn 45. Now, again, it could happen, but put all together, it just doesn't seem quite plausible. So this should be sending up, if not red flags, should be putting up some yellow flags that, hey, maybe there are some other things I need to be looking at. You know, have I combined people with the same name? Have I put children in here that aren't hers? So again, it's not saying that it's wrong, but it is saying that eh, it just doesn't feel quite right 
really should look at this a little bit more closely. So there are some great ways to use timelines. We can use them to give us ideas of other places to, places to search, other records to look for, like we did with George Cassidy. And we can also use it as a sanity check. Next week, here on the archives.com live stream, we are going to the chapel, getting the most out of marriage records. And that will be next Wednesday, March 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific. Hope that you can join us then. In the meantime, be sure to stay connected with archives.com, whether it's on the blog, on Facebook, on Twitter. All of our previous live streams have been archived and uploaded to our YouTube channel. And for those of you who are going to Roots Tech, please stop by and see us. We are going to be in booth 301. We'll be happy to see you. Until next time, this is Amy Johnson Crow. Happy researching.